morning and welcome to worship at Broad Street United Methodist Church. We hope that you have found us one way or the other online or by, by the radio. And we are really glad that technology gives us a way to join our hearts in worship. And this is the second Sunday after the Epiphany here. You'll notice the green cloths and the appearance has changed. Uh, this is our season to recognize what the gift of Christ can bring. And so welcome, welcome, welcome to our worship. We would be very happy for you to join us immediately after the service uh, in a, on a Zoom call, which you either got by email or anybody can see below the screen uh, for the, the video of the service today under the See More right after the scripture, if you will click that, you can be right there and we can have some face-to-face -face time where we can share about the, our, the life in the church and our congregation and it's just great to see people as best we can. So we would be happy to have you uh, following the service for that opportunity. We are continuing in our focusing on the John Wesley Covenant prayer in terms of our discipleship life together this month and so we would want you to join us tonight on Facebook Live at 8 o'clock where I'll be talking about the third category of concerns that are lifted up by the Wesley Covenant Prayer. Tuesday night, Aaron has a Zoom Bible study about the Covenant Prayer and how it implements and changes our lives and every, every day on the church's Facebook page, there will be some thought-provoking reflection on some phrase of the Wesley Prayer. Beginning next week, we hope to have ways for you to start signing up for our Lenten small groups. And we just hope that in this time that we will put down deep, deep spiritual roots and we invite you to join us for that. We also wanna catch you up a little bit on things in regard to our staff. And that is that Gina Bullens, who is, serves on our staff as the communications uh, expert that we have, who does things so beautifully for us, her father died this past Tuesday in Hickory. Uh, his name was Judd Lawing, and his service, uh, graveside service, was yesterday. So I hope you'll be lifting Gina up in your love and prayers. And as you know, Debbie Williamson's father died the week before Christmas. We've been happy to have her back in the office this week. And so, but, but, but keep Debbie and her family in prayer as they walk this grief valley. And then we've had a happy uh, addition in our staff family as Cindy and Bob Pike's son and daughter-in-law had their first grandson who was born on January 4th who, as you know, if you've been keeping up by Facebook, had some complications and ended up having heart surgery at Duke last week. Uh, the baby is doing very well, and we are thanking God for the progress that he has been able to have and the repair that was able to be done to his little heart. Uh, he'll be in the hospital at Duke for the coming, at least we're thinking, week. But if you would keep remembering them in prayer and it is our great privilege in Christian fellowship to hold each other up in prayer. Jesus called us to follow him and it gave us a chance to be a part of, of a company of people who walk the Christian life together. We extend our prayers to you and now for this time, we, we ask you to make sure that you have a, a time when you accept the peace of Christ and pass it on to others. If you're worshiping by yourself, I, I hope that you will give yourself a hug or up, extend your hands and say, I receive the peace of Christ. If you're worshiping with others in a family circle, I hope that you'll, you'll take this time to, to say the peace of Christ be with you. And as we all share this time together, let's put it in our hearts to Ask God who we can extend the peace of Christ to beyond the confines of the worship service so that we can be followers of Christ together, living and sharing his peace. May the peace of Christ 
be with you. Father, we just thank you so much for this beautiful, glorious day that you have given us to come and worship you. Whether we're at home, whether we're in the car, wherever we may be, I just pray, Lord, that everyone will feel your presence in a real and mighty way. Today, Lord, we're talking about calling disciples. Well, each one of us, if we have been called by you, have been called to be disciples. And I just pray that we take that serious and realize it's our job to tell others about you and the truth about you and the difference that has made in our lives. There are many people today who are hurting, who are sick, who just need to feel your comfort and peace. And we ask that you minister to them. There are people that just need encouragement, who feel so all alone, and I just pray that someone will call or text or send a note to let them know that they care. Lord, there's somebody in our own lives we need to encourage, and I just pray that you impress their name upon our hearts and help us to share the love of Christ with them. 
We miss our church, the people that make up this church. We miss them. We miss seeing them every week. And we just pray, Lord, it won't be long before we can all be back together again. And I just ask today that you be with Mary John as she leads us in your word, that you fill her with your grace and your spirit. And Lord, that that great love will just spill over to each one of us. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. good come out of Statesville? I mean, really. Have you walked down the street and seen some of the people that walk down the street in Statesville? Oh, I'm not quite sure if anything good can come out of Statesville. Yes, it can. I know two people that are in this room with me right now that I haven't known a long time, but I know that there are at least two that I have written something about that I can say is something good that would come out of Statesville. And one of them, believe it or not, is Aaron. I made a little sign here, and what are the good things about him? I put that he's a good listener, he's called. He's generous, he's really generous with his time. He's talented, and most importantly, he's a God follower. So, yeah, there's one good thing that can come out of Statesville. But then there's another one that I have just had the privilege to meet recently. And she is the beautiful lady that does our singing every week. Her name is Cam. And I put on here that she's always willing. She has to learn new songs every week. And she doesn't ever say, I'm not doing that song. That's boring. She just does whatever's asked of her. She's also generous with her time. She's a helper. She's kind, very talented, but most importantly, she's a Christian. Well, there are good things that can come out of Statesville. Well, what would somebody say about you if they were saying, well, do you know anything good that can come out of Statesville? Would they say your name? I would sure hope that they would say my name. And that is what kind of what our lesson is about today. And I think if I had to choose one word, that word would be truth. Well, what does truth mean? Truth is an agreement with a fact or reality. You know, as followers of Jesus, sometimes we wonder if everything that we are told is really true. The world is fat, filled with bad news so when you hear that Jesus is good news, that seems almost too good to be true. Sometimes we have doubts, we have questions, but guess what? Those are normal parts of faith. And what is faith? That is believing in something that we can't even see. Nathaniel is a guy that we're talking about today in Philip. And Philip told Nathaniel about Jesus, and Nathaniel's response was, He's from Nazareth. Mm. Nothing good comes out of Nazareth. This is little bitty town. Uh, no, I've heard so many bad things about Nazareth. There is no way anything good can come out of Nazareth. But he said, um, I'll go and see Jesus. Well, when he went to see Jesus, Jesus told Nathaniel the truth about him. In return, Nathaniel told Jesus the truth about him. He called him the Son of God. Think about it. What can we do as Christians to invite other people to Christ? You can ask them to watch the service. You can send them notes. You can encourage them. You can tell them the difference that Christ has made in your life. Jesus praised Nathaniel for his faith and told him that his faith would continue to grow. Well, the same is true for us. We have faith. And if we spend time with Jesus and we spend time sharing that with others, our faith is going to continue to grow. So my challenge to you is, think about yourself. 
Can anything good like Cindy Pike come out of Statesville? Well, put your name in that. Would you be somebody that Jesus Christ would call to be one of his disciples? He's already called me, and I said yes. What will your answer be? Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for being the truth. Thank you for showing the truth. And I just pray that you will give us opportunities to share your truth with others. That, Lord, we will take the call of being a disciple very seriously. And we will be able to tell people, you are the Son of God and the difference that you made in our lives. And help us this week to find ways to encourage others by sharing our faith. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. pray with me? Holy God, God of power and might, God of grace, God who surrenders heaven to be born in a barn. God, I pray that you are at work in us today, that as we're looking at our world and we're realizing that there are crazy things happening. God, that we know that you are at work and that you will use whatever situations arise and turn the bad around, God, and bring glory and life from ashes. God, you turn graves into gardens. God, I pray that you are working in our lives and turning these bones into your armies. God, some of us feel like we can't. Some of us feel like we've never been good enough. Some of us feel like whatever we have to offer, it's not enough. It's not worthy. God, speak truth to us today. And remind us that even if we're not worthy, the cross covers all. Remind us that, that you appeal to angels to, to go to the shepherds not to the rich. God, remind us that, that you seek out the, the disciples who are fishermen, not the studious disciples who are well-learned. God, and I pray that you remind us that we can be used for your glory. And whatever steps those are, God, I pray that you bend us to your will. Help us to submit. Help us to follow you and to seek out whatever mission it is that you have for us. We love you. Amen. The scripture today is from John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found out about him who Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
I messed up and I had the scripture in front of the offering. And so we're going to do the offering now. Uh, as we're thinking about where we've come from and what can God do with us. Part of offering is that we, we give these gifts that, that may seem insufficient. And indeed, there's nothing that we could give God that is enough for God. But God takes these gifts and takes our offerings, whatever we can give, and he turns them into something beautiful and worthy. And so we're asking for money. We're asking for whatever financial gifts you can give. And in fact, there should be a link in the description today to help you do that online if that's something that you're inclined to do. Also, we're asking for your time. We're asking for your faith. We're asking for your ability to, to look at things calmly and say, wherever things are, God is at work. What are you willing to offer to God to be made into something beautiful? Let us pray. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Help us to come and see. Come and see beyond our skepticism. Come and see beyond our reservations. Come and see what you have to offer to us. Open our eyes our ears and our minds to give your word a new chance in our hearts. We are so grateful that you call us. We are not unmindful of what an extraordinary privilege that is. And now we want to hear the call. Come and see believing that Christ is the life and the truth and the way. Through your Holy Spirit, give us that individual and intimate message that each of us needs as we offer ourselves to you. Amen. If I ask, where are you from? For some of you, that will be a simple question. That is, 
if I'm, I'm looking around at our worship team now and I say, Rusty Lee, where are you from? He's going to say Statesville. <laughs> it's a, that's a fairly, fairly easy, straightforward question. And because of that, you would have some sense of identification. You might make some assumptions about Rusty and the experiences that shaped him. If I ask Aaron where he's from, he'll probably say Shelby. And if you know Shelby or have some connection with Shelby, then, then that'll start, you know, that's how this goes. If you ask Cindy where she's from, she'll say Nashville, North Carolina. And there will be, a, if you have any affiliation with that, then that's kind of where you kind of begin your connecting with people. If you ask me where I'm from, it's much more complicated. <laughs> Anytime you ask a preacher's kid, where they're from, it's more complicated <laughs> as, as we, we go from place to place in life. And at, if I gave you my trajectory of where I'm from, lots of the places, maybe the, because I have so many multiple points, maybe you would have some way to connect. That's what we do. And just so you know, I have learned as clergy that there are Everybody falls into two categories in, in almost, well, in every church I've been in. FH and NFH. Now, you may think you may not have heard of that category before, but I bet you have. You see, you're either from here or not from here. <laughs> now, I know that because a preacher is always NFH or usually, or certainly in, in our Methodist circles, we are NFH. We are, you're not from here, are you? I learned about those categories in, in when I had the wonderful opportunity to serve in Spruce Pine, North Carolina for seven years. And they're the ones that first put it in those, in those letters because they would talk about people who were driving in town in the summers. They say, oh, that, they're NFH. I said, what's that mean? I said, they're the foreigners. I said, the foreigners? I, I didn't know we had foreigners. And they said, oh, well, you know, those people from Florida. Okay, I had to do some a little work on that. Uh, people from Florida are not really foreigners, <laughs> but they are NFH, meaning they are not from Spruce Pine. They're not from here, but they came for six months out of the year to enjoy the beauty of the North Carolina mountains instead of the hot uh, of, of their homes and cities in Florida. FH and NFH, we make identifications with people based on labels and associations and where they're from. And so when Philip says to Nathaniel, come, come and see this Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, it, when we know the history, we're not surprised that actually Nathaniel would go, Nazareth, could anything good come out of Nazareth? I mean, Nazareth was just a little place, maybe two to 400 people in Jesus' day. It, it had no distinctive characteristics that, that, that you would brag about in terms of either its location or its industry or its composition to the, to the culture in Jesus' day. How wonderful of God for his son to grow up in Nazareth. <laughs> Good job, great almighty and all-knowing God. Nazareth was no place that had any consequence, no bragging points. And not only that, Nazareth actually was known as a place where really terrible things happened. Not really because of anybody at Nazareth, but in the time of Herod the Great, who we talked about just a couple weeks ago, in the time of Herod the Great, the, the capital, which was about four miles from Nazareth, Zephorus, that somebody raided the, the Roman supplies that were kept there. And if you remember what we talked about with Herod the Great, if, if you did anything that got crossways with him, there was, oh my gosh, to pay 
for it. And there was. And there, uh, they say that over 2,000 Jews were crucified, including people from Nazareth, many from Nazareth, just because of its proximity. Because Herod the Great wanted to make an example of what it was going to mean to cross the Romans by trying to steal from their supplies. No, people, Nazareth, people in Nazareth had a hard time. Later on, just, just prior to, to this time, there was a tax revolt that, was, that took place in Nazareth. And one of Herod's sons who had learned from his father's example clamped down on that. Nazareth was a place where bad things happened. Not because the people were bad, but because of the cruelty in the culture. So you really can't blame Nathaniel for his question. You can't just say, well, there's no, what, what is wrong with Nathaniel? You see, this is the thing. There were a lot of, of negative or, or s certainly neutral things associated with Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? But allegiance to that prejudice that had formed in his mind could have made this good man missed the most important adventure of his entire life, the opportunity to connect with Jesus Christ. John Wesley said of this text that in this story, God is calling us to make a profound examination of the prejudices that shape our judgments. And today, the challenge from the light of the world is to see beyond our personal prejudice and to examine what we do when in the face of conversation these opinions formed by prejudice cropped up. Do you follow the prejudice? Lots of times we do. Can we open to the possibilities of something that we would never have dreamed unless we let go of those prejudices? This is an invitation this morning. Come and see what can happen when that's done. I want you to think back about stereotypes that you have grown up with or that you have heard commonly spoken of in circles associated with these words. A skinny little black girl descended from slaves Raised by a single mother. Now tell me honestly, what does that bring to your mind? National Poet Laureate? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. But if you accepted the invitation to come and see at the inauguration on Wednesday, you would have seen a dramatic example of how stereotypes can limit us and make us look like fools if we're not careful. When 22-year-old Amanda Gorman stepped out to the microphone at the inauguration, you or I or anyone operating on standard prejudices could have said, could anything worthy of our time come from this very young black girl? Well, I don't know about you, but when Amanda Gorman read her poem, The Hill We Climb, I heard some of the most eloquent poetry I have ever heard in all of my life, my entire life. Come and see. Open your heart. Give something a chance to engage you and bless you in wonderful new ways. Now, the other thing, I mean, Wesley is right about examining the prejudices that shape us and, and form opinions pre, prematurely, maybe, and sometimes falsely. But this is the dynamic I'm inviting us to today. I'm inviting us to also remember that the call of Nathaniel also gives us a chance to get the affirmation 
Please hear it. It is an affirmation. Good people, hear me. Good people have prejudices that limit them, that hurt them and others. Good people. Jesus is very clear here. Good people have these prejudices. Jesus said of Nathanael, this is a man, uh, an, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Friends, you don't hear Jesus saying that very often. I mean, that's a, it's, he does occasionally commend people like the Roman centurion. Or, I mean, he, Jesus recognizes goodness. He knows it. He, he lifts it up. It just doesn't happen very often. But Nathaniel is a man that Jesus says has no deceit in him. Jesus says, this is a good man. We are living, dear friends, in a day of great opportunity for us to recognize the prejudices that we good people have. It is unparalleled, in, in, at least in my own lifetime, for us to say things or raise things that in prior decades in my life, whether it's in the community or in the church, we just didn't talk about. We just flat did not talk about. Doesn't mean they weren't there, it just meant we just, we just ignored them, we toughed it out, we just moved forward. We did not, though, directly address Things that have long, that's why, that's why we've got so much passion going on in our culture these days, in my opinion. It's because of what we have stuffed down for sometimes lifetimes. And so when something can be named and can be clearly named that is a symptom of, of something else, then, then we get the whole nine yards of the passion that goes with it. Sometimes that's beneficial and sometimes that turns out to overflow in, in negative ways. But I'm just telling you, friends, we've never had such a day, at least in my lifetime, when we're honest about all kinds of things or people tell stories that they have kept in for years, for decades. And now this is a time that we, we are living in a day of great opportunity to recognize our prejudice. But the sad part of this to me is that people across the culture and often in the church have taken that opportunity and they turn it into a war. They turn it into a war by saying, oh, I don't have any prejudices. Oh, please. And that they see the opportunity to re-examine their personal prejudices as a personal attack on their goodness. It is not. And so instead of having the opportunity, as Nathaniel did, to, to say, well, maybe I ought to take a look at this, people hunker down. They, they get angry. They, they feel like they, that they're character is being attacked they're defensive and then it just gets worse dear friends this is this is tragic it, it is tragic to the essence of christian faith because a prejudice is a blind spot everybody's got blind spots we know that we we know two things in in basic christian theology you could not possibly have gone to church very long not heard these all of us are sinners. All of us are sinners. And that means that everybody's got something to examine. Everybody has some, and, and that those blind spots close us off to the full possibilities. That's what repentance is all about. It is fundamental to who we are. Who needs to repent? Bad people? Yeah. Good people? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what, that's what this Wesley prayer is all about. The, the Wesley prayer would not be prayed by people who were not devout. Nobody would sit through the John Wesley covenant service once a year to get to that prayer unless they already had something in their heart for God. 
But, but the Wesley prayer says, I give you all of me. And, and, and I am at your service, God. It's not saying, well, God, look at me. Look at how good I am. Leave me alone. I mean, we don't even understand that language, but we watch that play out all over the place. And, and when people have their prejudices brought to light, as it happens in the, this encounter with Nathaniel, Nathaniel takes the opportunity to take the invitation of Philip to come and see, and it changes his life forever. And when you and I have the chance to take it as an opportunity for spiritual growth, to look at our blind spots, friends, everybody has them. I don't know anybody that doesn't have blind spots, and truth is, you don't either. Now, for safety's sake on the road, we, we, we look for our blind spots. We look to buy a car. I look to buy a car that's going to tell me when there's a car in my blind spot and warn me. The gospel can do that for us. It can say, you, <laughs> you got something in your blind spot. Don't, don't pull over. Don't, don't jump in. Don't stick with it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hit you. It's going to hurt you. We don't listen. When the warning comes from the gospel and it is to our everlasting detriment and the pain just keeps piling up. Dear friends, it's time to break that cycle. Nathaniel has every reason to say, could anything good come out of Nazareth? Had he lived, had he defended, had he dug in to that prejudice, He'd have missed the opportunity of a lifetime. And this morning, I want us to wonder, with a holy wonder, what we miss when we dig in to our prejudices, even prejudices that have some basis in history or have some basis in personal encounter or have some basis, as Nathaniel's did. Because God's always looking to do a new thing with us. So isn't it just amazing that the great God Almighty would pick a town like Nazareth to have something supremely good emerge? And doesn't that link up with what Jesus himself is saying? You can't believe all the good things you're going to see. He says, Nathaniel, you, you believe in me because I saw you under the fig tree? D, geez, I got so many more things for you to see. Come and see. Dear friends, the first thing that I want to say is it's amazing to me that Jesus called disciples at all. Beautiful, I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful thing that the great God Almighty called fallible human beings like Philip and Andrew and Peter and Nathaniel. That's one amazing thing. But I want you to notice in the calling of the disciples, Jesus does not call them all individually. He did, he did call Philip and say, follow me, and Philip did follow. But then it's Philip that finds Nathaniel. And you'll find in the other gospel accounts that it, 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 it's Andrew and, and Peter who go and get their brothers and get their friends and bring them to Jesus. The, the cadre of disciples is not formed by Jesus going to pick each one individually. He picks some and they go to others that they love and they care about, as in this text, and bring them to Jesus. Jesus does not call Nathaniel directly. He called Philip directly. And Philip is the one who went to Nathaniel. Now, dear friends, I think this pattern is still the way God works. And if God calls Cindy and if God calls me and if, if, if when God calls each one of us, then it is our privilege. It is our high calling 
so that our words and that our conversations with the people we love draw other people to Jesus directly. And that's my question this morning. Are people finding Jesus through you? Do people find Jesus through me? One of the sweetest moments I've had in ministry was my daughter who called me from graduate school at Duke. Who said, you'll never guess what happened today. That's really not a good lead for a preacher's kid to start a conversation with. Because my mind always goes to the usually negative things that require my pastoral attention. She told me about being in class. First day. Students introducing each other. When she introduced herself as Christy Dye, her professor said, are you any relation to Mary John Dye? And Christy said, she's my mother. And her brilliant professor, Dr. Kathy Rudy said, your mother is the one who led me to Jesus. Now, what Dr. Rudy said to Christy is really a very generous interpretation of what happened one night when we were staying with a friend in Durham. I was doing research for a doctoral paper and had a chance to meet a brilliant young, much more brilliant than I'll ever be. But she had questions about Jesus. She had grown up in a different denominational faith, and we stayed up all night, one of those wonderful just talk about Jesus nights. I never knew what that, the fruit that that bore in her life until all those years later when in front of a whole classroom of people, she said to my daughter, your mother is the way I found Jesus. So dear friends, I want to invite us here to not give up on people with their prejudices because it could have been that when Philip went to get Nathaniel and Nathaniel said nothing good ever comes out of Nazareth Philip could have walked away but he didn't he said come and see it was Philip's response that made all the difference it was Philip's response that was the connecting link. And I'm begging us to rise to the high calling of being the, the connecting link between people whose prejudices will keep them imprisoned for, with people whose right or wrongly formed prejudices will keep them in a box, be the connecting link. That brings them to Jesus. It is the high calling of disciples. May it be ours. Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, it just simply takes our breath away that you called us fallible broken, mistaken prone, blindsided people to be your disciples. We know we're not perfect. We don't pretend to be. We know better. I'm praying that your Holy Spirit helps us look at the prejudices that we've accumulated along the way. Those, those labels or those stereotypes or those associations that, that absolutely crush our ability to open our own hearts to new places of growth. And dear God, help us come and see, come and see our own, our own prejudices as an opportunity to grow to be more godly help us to help other people in their blind spots to save them from danger and damage help us to come and see that our words that our actions that our facebook post that our facial expressions 
everything sanctified can be an opportunity to be a connecting link for good people with prejudices to a lifelong walk with the Savior. And may we, when we say yes, we've decided to follow Jesus, let us say yes, we are all in to inviting others to do the same by what they see in us. And now, thank you for the way that you use our desire to follow you. Perfect us and help us to invite others to your peace. Amen. I love our closing hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus. Can't even count how many times I've sung it, whether it was around a campfire at camp or MYF, I mean, at the altar of the church. It's familiar. I'm gonna invite you to sing where you are. I don't just want you to sing because it's a long time hymn of the church, but I'm gonna ask you to sing with your heart. Because Jesus needs disciples and that disciples mean those who follow. And I want, I'm praying that you'll follow with a sense of God calling us to a wholeness that is beyond our belief, that God is calling all of us and helping to equip us to be a part of the healing of the world. I have decided to follow Jesus. There is no greater set of words to say that can make such a life-changing difference as our closing hymn. I'm praying that you sing it as a prayer as well as an opportunity to tap into the musical wealth of the church. No turning back. No turning back. Dear Lord, Scripture doesn't tell us if Nathaniel had brothers or cousins or just some friends who were there that day when Philip called and invited him to come meet Jesus of Nazareth. But it's certainly possible that there were others that Nathaniel knew or was with that day who did not accept the call. Thank God, Nathaniel would say if he were here, that I was willing to step outside my preconceived notions. Thank God I listened to Philip because that for me began a lifetime of personal engagement with the Son of God and his kingdom. And so today, I invite you to come and see 
beyond the many prejudices this world would use to constrain us to the beauty and the calling of God's work in us all. And may you feel the rich voice of Almighty God inviting us to a full holiness and the opportunities that we have to connect others that we love with this life-giving Savior. It not only is what saves us for all eternity, but it is our highest privilege to be a connecting link with others. May you experience the adventure of being a disciple of Jesus this week. And may the peace of God fill your heart. Amen. Oh, Christ, I